Good morning, and welcome to the forum. I am Sally Howard. I am the Senior Associate for Pastoral Care, Healing and Health, and Spiritual Growth here at All Saints Church, and I want to welcome you to the forum, those of you who are here and those of you who are streaming. Um, we're glad you're with us. Just some practical things before we start. Uh, there are restrooms outside this door into the next door, and also gender neutral and fully accessible bathroom in the OCC trailer outside the door. Um, and following this forum, uh, we will again get the uh, opportunity to listen to Pastor Eddie. Um, and really unusual for us, you guys, he preaches two different sermons, one at the nine. So if you were at the nine, stay for the 1115 and um, stay tuned uh, for um, a, an amazing uh, spirit-led filled experience. James Baldwin once wrote, we made the world we're living in and we have to make it over. And I'm here to tell you that Pastor Eddie is calling us out and empowering us to make this world over. He is a third generation uh, child of preachers, um, but he didn't go straight into the ministry thinking that he would do something else. Uh, but um, God called him back to this. He, he did community organizing also in the West End of Atlanta. Uh, he attended the Claremont School of Theology. And once the bishop heard him preach, uh, the story goes that the bishop went to him directly and said, uh, I think you should think about whether you've missed your calling, because that was a great, great sermon. So um, lucky for all of us, uh, he did stay at Claremont, and he did change course into being a pastor. He was also the president of the Pan-African Seminarians Association and the co-chairperson of the Interreligious Council. He was the youngest pastor ever picked for the historic McCarty Memorial Christian Church located in the West Adams neighborhood of Los Angeles and the youngest pastor in the denomination on the West Coast. Uh, they brought him here to shake things up and shake him up he is. <laughs> he is currently uh, the co-organizer of Trust Talks for LA, an organization that holds roundtable discussions between the LAPD and the community of Los Angeles concerning policing and policy issues in downtown LA in an effort to bring forth collaborative solutions. And he is also the California co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, reminding us that the golden state needs to be the place of the golden rule. And without further words from me, may we welcome Pastor Eddie Anderson. Thank you, Sally, and thank all of you for enduring me for another, another half hour. So I am glad to be here and to represent the California Poor People's Campaigning and National Call for More Revival. It is a part of the larger movement that the Reverend Dr. William Barber and the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris have started in starting back up what Dr. King left off. So in 1967, uh, Dr. King and others were in Montgomery actually, and they started planning the Poor People's Campaign. You may remember the mule carts going uh, to DC, but Dr. King was tragically uh, taken away and stolen from us, so they never really got to see the full uh, height or zenith of what the Poor People's Campaign could look like. And so for the past three years, we have been revitalizing this campaign. And so instead of me just talking the whole time, I like to do this a little differently. I'm gonna show you a video of some of the work we've been doing recently across the country. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit, maybe five to six minutes, about what we're doing in California. And then I want to dialogue. Whatever questions you have uh, about the campaign or how you can get involved, let's talk about that as well. Is that okay? Beautiful. So let's uh, watch this video. What happens in Wall Street often doesn't say a thing about what's happening on the real streets of America. Well, there are thousands who are not free. Yeah. 
And we know when one person is not free, none of us are free. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that this isn't the case in God's economy. Right. It doesn't have to be this way. That's right. That's right. We can do better. Yeah. We can do better! Yeah. We can do better! In America, we are taught that if you are poor, if you are homeless, if you are dispossessed, disenfranchised, it's because you've done something wrong, it's because you are inferior, it is because you are insufficient. And we believe that that is wrong. There are 140 million people in the United States who either live in poverty or are low income, who are one paycheck away from being homeless, or one wildfire away from being homeless, or one missed rent check or car payment away from being homeless. That's over a third of the United States. Now to me, that is our deep shame as a country. That is a moral emergency, and that's why we need a poor people's campaign across the entire nation. We are identifying ourselves with this movement. And what that means is we're saying, hey, we're part of something bigger. I understand some things about poverty because I am a poor person. We believe that when poor people name their own priorities because they know their own needs and know what needs to happen, that real change will be produced. If poor people are not allowed to speak these priorities for themselves, no one else will. It's hard enough just to live on this earth and survive. And this shouldn't make it any more difficult. You shouldn't be homeless and be a criminal just because you're homeless. That's right. It's sad, sad. The homelessness that you're seeing in the streets of LA in our community, you can see it all up and down the state. People encamped in the streets, living in their cars, in RVs, in garages. It's a growing phenomenon. And one thing that's important for me to point out, I don't think this is because people just don't know how to manage their finances. This is an economic devastation based on a systemic root. She said it wasn't a tornado. The tornadoes came, and then it was, at, they dropped enough, but then after that, then another storm came. And that's what created all this flood now. And this water is not only dirty, but it's got s snakes, right. alligators, alligators. Yeah. yeah, and children here. You know what they said? They said only two houses were affected. That's the official report. You can walk down that street right now with your own two eyes and see more than two houses that were affected. How about if we tell some truth up in here? It's truth telling time. That which you do to the least of these, you do it unto me. We thought we were going off to be heroes. But what we found was that we were no more than pawns. And when we come home, we come home to live in an unjust and unequal society with the largest prison complex in the world and a political system that seeks to oppress voting rather than to expand it. North Carolina a and students has the largest population and concentration of young eligible black voters in this state. Speak a word, Nick. So this is the line, Leslie. It goes all the way down. You've got this, these dormitories over here. And those over there. And those are on the other side. Yeah, as far as we can tell, this is the only HBCU like this. I acknowledge freely that this would be a political gerrymander, which is not against the law. I think electing Republicans is better than electing Democrats. So I drew this map to help foster what I think is better for the country. I want to push back against the words of a racist and acknowledge that what happened on this campus was racist gerrymandering and not political gerrymandering. This was an attempt to suppress the black student vote. Something's got to be done to help people with disabilities to vote. One of my concerns is when I went to vote, when the little sheet came out of the thing that showed what I voted for, I couldn't read it. It was in small print. Let the people vote! Yeah. That's how you honor veterans. I get tired of hearing a certain false narrative. And it's that people like myself are weak, lazy, and immoral. But this is far from the truth because weak, lazy, and immoral is letting human beings live in the streets while billionaires receive trillion dollar tax cuts. Denying health care to millions, cutting social services for the poor, and privatizing the VA while dropping bombs on brown people thousand miles away 
diverting money from poor Americans to pay for those bombs and lying for the reasons why the bombs are even being dropped, caging immigrant children, Come on, Mike. ignoring ecological devastation in poor communities is weak, lazy, and immoral. Uh, this was the site of the first of the three major fires that Lewiston experienced in, in 2013. They were all arson, and there was a lot of agreement that the fires themselves were tragic, but it surfaced uh, this ongoing tension that we have in the community um, over, you know, who, who, we, who we consider to be a part of our community. And, and, and many times it's not even coded. It's literally, you know, we have too many immigrants, uh, their homes burnt down, so let's not rebuild them because, you know, we, we need less people like that here. They tell you something is wrong. Mm -hmm. All of us are suffering from the same thing, heart disease, asthma. Mm. All of these same mm, sickness. Same sickness. <laughs> something is wrong. That's right. Why is nobody doing it? Why is nobody researching it? That's right. I have no way out. The federal government have posts on everything. Nobody cares about us. Did you hear me? Look at everything the United States is doing. Look at all the wealth. That's all ours. I mean, that's all the Native American. It's easy to lose that focus because everybody came in that second chapter. But they got to go to the first chapter. The first chapter is going to tell the story of this country. You know, and then Congress or nobody can turn away from it. So, you know, this Poor People's Campaign needs to know that they have artillery, you know, religious artillery that can help the movement. But if you don't recognize us, and then it goes back to that second chapter that we're the forgotten ones. There are currently more than 11,000 unaccompanied children in the care of the U.S. and Humane Services. This policy is inhumane. It is immoral. To remain silent is to be complicit. There is no individual solution to the social and economic problems that working women face. We do not live in a mom-friendly or child-friendly country. We face inadequate paid maternity leave, abysmal postpartum health care, equally appalling access to quality child care and public education. I feel expendable, and if I am expendable, so too are children. And that I cannot stand for. So we have to hold these politicians accountable. That's where our problem is. In St. John, people are not participating in these elections. Because these people who we elect, they are not representing us. There's other systems here that are oppressing us that voting won't always fix. And that we've got to like, we've got to talk about, we've got to call it out, and we've got to mobilize and build a movement to be able to change these things that our politicians won't always change. But I have to tell you, there's something going on in this nation right now. There's a beautiful birth of a movement. And it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us to stand up and say, I lived at a time when kids were going hungry and homeless, when they were closing hospitals and health care centers, when racists were emboldened. But I linked arms with people. I stood up and acted for justice, and we changed it. We changed it. Forward together! It's movement time. It's time to shake this nation, because this nation is locked up. Our politics are small and binding, but we are those who can see the cracks in the walls and the way to come out of the cells and we are determined to be free. And we're determined to see other folk free. Free with living wages. Right? Free. Free with health care. Free. Free with food on their tables and free with good housing and free with good water and land and air. And free with justice. That is the call of this movement. And we are the front line. So 
So we have the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. And we've been traveling across this country, as you can see in this video, raising up that we need a more revival. That we're no longer allowing racism and poverty and economic devastation and militarism to run rampant in our lands. That we can say something about it. And as Sally reminded you, when, I, when we go protest in California, I often like to say we are the golden state that has yet to follow the golden rule. And some may say, why golden state, golden rule? What, what is that about? So the number I want you to remember is one in five. One in five people in California are, are struggling with economic flourishing. One in five people are close to being poor. One in five children are poor in California. One in five people who go to community college in California are poor, are homeless, and living in, in gyms and in cars and in shelters. One in five. Think about that. In this room, if we did one in five, that's about half the room, just about people who are wrestling and are close to or paycheck away from being poor. And it is immoral. It is wrong. And Jesus reminds us that what we do to the least of these, we do also unto him. That he was naked and we didn't clothe him. He was hungry and we decided not to feed him. That we avoided poverty instead of looking it in the face, and that poverty affects all of us. And so for the last two and a half years, uh, this campaign has been building a movement. Uh, we started in California, actually at my church, we had Dr. Barbara and others, out in 2017. And we launched the Poor People's Campaign in California. Uh, and since then, we've been a little busy. Uh, so we uh, have six regions across the state. Each region has its own organizing committee. So there's a region for Los Angeles, and then there's also a region for the San Gabriel Valley uh, that we work with as well. And then we work together to uplift and to say there needs to be a difference. The campaign has done an audit called the Audit of Poor Folk, the Soul of Poor Folk. Right? And it talks about what does poverty actually look like in America. One thing that we do in this movement is we make sure that it's not talking heads like myself who get to talk all the time, uh, but we make sure people who are actually impacted, people who are closest to the pain, people who are living with the conditions of poverty, of war, of economic devastation, are the ones who tell their stories. That's what you saw in the video. Uh, people telling their own story. And so we let, released an audit uh, to the entire country to talk about what that story looks like. Uh, then, uh, at the beginning of this year, we released something called a higher budget. So it's a moral budget. If our budget in America actually put people first and not profit, what would it look like? And so we released the moral budget, and then what you saw uh, here was that we took people to the Capitol and we testified around why we need a moral budget. Uh, this past June, uh, we had a gathering in D.C. It was called the Moral People's Congress and Assembly. And people from all across the country came together to talk about what do they want to see in the future? What is the country, what is our moral imagination saying to us is possible? And so uh, I want to have you write this down, June 20th, 2020. June 20th, 2020, uh, we are planning a march on Washington. And the, and the idea is, after Democratic primaries and before Republican primaries, we want to shift the narrative. And so we're going to bring as many people as possible to Washington, D.C., to say we have a list of demands. You can go to poorpeople'scampaign.org and you'll see a list of demands. And we say, we have a list of demands and we have a moral budget and the people are sick and tired and can't take it anymore. 
And we're asking all of you to join us. Call your friends, call your, your, your loved ones, to tell your family, to tell your denomination, to tell the people who, who are religious and people who just love being human, right, that they too are included because we believe in an America where all are included. That doesn't matter your ability or, or lack of ability, doesn't matter your sexuality, your color, your race, or your class. God still says, you're included. And that means something. We may have forgotten that, uh, but that means something. And so this is what the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for More Revival is doing. It's asking each and every one of us that when we sit quiet and when we dream with our moral imagination, there is something that tells us we can do better. That we don't have to have militarism or a war economy or racism, or economic devastation, or poverty running rampant in our streets. In Los Angeles County alone, uh, there are over 50,000 homeless people. The number is closer to like 55,000. The number has increased 18% since last year, right? <laughs> On any given night in Los Angeles County, there are 4,000 young people between the ages of 18 and 24 who have nowhere to go. And so we have to look ourselves in the face sometimes and say, we can do better. And the Poor People's Campaign says, we don't have to get sad about it, but we can get activated. We can do something. We can join hands in this movement and take it the next step. Dr. King realized in 1967 that what we need in our country are ambulance drivers. People who will drive through the red lights, the red tapes that say, stop, no, you're going too far, don't bring this up, don't talk about that. And to sound the alarm and say, we have a problem here and we can do something about it. And like those ambulance drivers, we can be the paramedics, the MDs, to come out and say, we know how to resuscitate the heart of America, for it truly is on life support. And so, with the Poor People's Campaign, uh, I encourage you to get involved uh, with the Poor People's Campaign in your region and what that, what that looks like. What does involvement look like? So I want to make sure we cover that. So we don't expect everyone to go and get uh, civil disobedience. We don't say you get arrested because no one plans to get arrested. It happens sometimes. Um, so we don't assume that you want to do civil disobedience, but you can do some things. You can call your congressman, you can call your senator, you can have house parties and tell people about what's going on and that this movement is happening, that people do care, right? You can even donate online to poorpeoplescampaign.org and help those who are impacted and poor get to D.C. to tell their testimony and their story. You can talk about it at work or uh, even just sign up on our mailing list. If you go to poorpeoplescampaign.org, you can be on our mailing list and we'll let you know when an action is happening near you. In California, uh, actions are happening all the time. And, and one thing that I want to make clear is this is a movement, not an organization, so we don't actually uh, say you're, you're not included. If you can agree to the basic principles of the campaign, we're down, right? That's how this works. It's a, it's a moral fusion movement, which means that we want uh, the environmentalists and we want the Black Lives Matter and we want uh, the people against the war and we want people who are just doing what they can in their church social justice group to all get together because we do believe that we are stronger together, right? That we the people are the ones who establish justice in our nation. Uh, so this is the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And all of us are included. Um, let's have a discussion. Cool? All right. So you've seen the video. I've talked a little bit. Let's, uh, I'll do stack. Or... That's great. I'm just using the microphone. Oh. You guys are going to have to speak. <laughs> OK. I got one over here.
Okay, so he, he said he reviewed the budget of the PPC online, and a part of that budget, there are some policy proposals. And one of the policies that is endorsed by the PPC is a wealth tax uh, that Elizabeth Warren had written up, that they that we endorse that uh, tax. Yeah, so the idea here is that uh, our country is a country of have and have nots. Um, and so we, the, the position of the campaign is that we can talk about policy and we want to make sure you put policy forth. Um, but when it comes to things like the wealth tax, we say like, yeah, everyone should pay their fair share, right? Like if you have more, then you're responsible to pay more, to take care of those who are living paycheck to paycheck, take care, help those get ahead who are um, working two and three jobs and still not have a living wage, right? We, one of our other partners is the 515, which is a national union. And while California is on its track to, or LA really, is on its track to make sure we get $15 an hour as a minimum wage, many places do not. But we also realize, well, the, the balance sheet is a little lopsided, right? And there are a lot of people who could actually do more to help uh, pay for some of the things like college for, for everyone pay for some of the things like making sure that everyone can have a living wage, those type of things. So that's one of the reasons why that specific policy has been endorsed. And the way that we endorse policies uh, is there's a council of uh, leaders from across the country, and we have like a Western, Midwest, East, and Southern, and then they vote on at the Congress and things of that nature, what do we want to see what do we think could actually make an impact now and in the future? Yeah, one in the two. I have a question about, you said A&R University in Greensboro, North Carolina. And, uh, oh, thanks. Um, I actually have a friend of mine who was elected as a congressman um, in North Carolina. And I personally uh, feel really invested in seeing uh, um, students uh, in the state of North Carolina succeed and not be um, a party to that type of gerrymandering. I would just like to learn more about that and who is kind of running that um, uh, that sort of campaign on that college and if you have more information. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so North Carolina A&T, that's on the slide, they, they had a very peculiar way of doing uh, gerrymandering. There's literally a yellow line through the middle of campus uh, and if you live on one side, you get to vote here. If you live on the other side, you live in another district. This, what it does suppress the vote is a part of the Southern strategy, and it also allows for Republicans to continue to get elected. Right? And uh, what, how is that being addressed? That, so Dr. Barber actually lives in North Carolina. So he's working directly with students there along with the North Carolina Poor People's Campaign. So like there's a California Poor People's Campaign and we have four co-chairs and I'm one of them. Uh, North Carolina has a similar body and they are working on that issue and trying to undo racist uh, laws. And so some of that may look like um, going through the courts. Dr. Barber was just on trial in North Carolina uh, because he protest and his charge was that he was too loud in the state capitol. <laughs> so, 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 you know, that, that was, uh, he gave them an example of what it means to be too loud in state capitol during the trial. Uh, but, so they're working on that gerrymandering type of law and reinstalling the right to vote. Um, because after the, we've gutted the Supreme Court, gutted the Civil Rights Act, it allowed for states like North Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, the original part of Southern strategy, to uh, have some draconian type of laws to eliminate people's voice to vote. Yes. Um, so I, I work with young people, poor young people, in Chicago and in Los Angeles, many who are incarcerated, some who aren't. Mm -hmm. And as I'm trying, I'm framing a question for you that, you know, knowing that I have this platform to speak with them, what they may want, what, how this, whatever you say, how it might help them. So most of them have no understanding of the past in terms mm -hmm. of the civil rights movement, the poor people's campaign. Um, can you share the differences in the focus of the poor people's campaign from the time of Martin Luther King to now, like what the focus is, how it's changed, mm -hmm. 
what is the same, what's different, and why this movement, why they should care about it. Many of them don't see that they're in the middle of it mm -hmm. and how it impacts them. I don't know, that's the best way I can yeah, ask. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful question, thank you. Um, so in 1967, Dr. King, when he, and, and others, so I didn't wanna say just Dr. King, there was a group of people. Um, so Dr. King and others, when they did the Peace campaign, they were talking about the three evils, right? So they're talking about racism, poverty, economic poverty, uh, as well as the war economy or militarism. Now, the king talked about these as the three evils. The, the update is that we added a fourth, which is ecological devastation, because climate change is real, right? And so we added ecological devastation. Another thing that you would see is that when Dr. King did it, uh, one of the ways that he did it, he, he, we did a similar thing. We did an organizing tour, we went around, um, and Dr. King also had an economic platform. We don't have an economic platform, we have a moral budget. So that's, that's, a, that's a difference. Uh, we both have similar demands on uh, the country and the nation about what we can do now. Um, and then uh, I think uh, another difference is that it's not a, we're not uh, creating something new. Dr. Barbara has to say this is more of a resurrection. People are at a fifth million, so yeah, you know what a resurrection is. So this is more of a, a resurrection, right? Uh, this isn't uh, something new, that we're taking what was in the past and reviving it for now, because when you look at the numbers, we actually have a higher disparity of poverty today than 1967. We actually have more incarceration today than in 1967, and that Jim Crow actually was just shifted from laws in the streets to paychecks, right? And so we noticed that that made a large disparity around have and have nots. In, in California alone, we are the richest and poorest state in the nation. How does that work? Right? right? We're the richest and poorest state in the nation. We have the highest number of millionaires and people with liquid wealth and the highest number of people who are poor. Right? So we said, hold up. Things have actually gotten worse since Dr. King talked and lived and preached. So we gotta do something about this. And how they're part of it, I think man, we, we, when we were in Fresno, uh, we were working with a bunch of youth and we said, just tell your story. Because oftentimes when you tell your story, you don't realize how impactful it is and how much intersection of poverty has touched your life that what you think is normal is not actually what should be a standard. And so when you tell your story, then it starts changing hearts and minds, right? Dr. King always used to say, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't, you know, legislate your heart, but I can, you know, legislate policy to make you stop hurting me, right? And when they asked uh, Coretta Scott King after uh, Dr. King was killed, they said, you know, what do you think about all of this? And she said, I, I care about the children because violence is poverty. Right? And so we have to lift that voice up as well. So I would say tell your, your kids to tell their story. And if they wanna, we do um, actions and stuff across the state, but you know, their, their story is their power. And their narrative is, is the most powerful thing they have. Oh, I'll let Sally do her thing. Yeah, whoever, yeah. There was like three. Yeah. You mentioned uh, moral imagination, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you unpackage that a little more and explain the ramifications of engaging in, in moral imagination? Oh yeah, so moral imagination is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, because it comes to us from Kelly Brown Douglas. Uh, she's an African-American theologian and she talks about how our nation has moral memory, right? That in our nation there, are places of great pain and hurt, but then there's also places where we see daylight. We see some things of hope. And that when we start dreaming, oftentimes we dream about what is right in front of us. But we don't trace back the moral memory. Because when we look back at the moral memory of our country, we realize that oppression is not new. When we look back at the moral memory of our country, we realize that violence and poverty is not new, 
but there's always been creative ways to do it. So moral imagination says, let's think about and open up a part of ourselves where we actually bring our faith, our spirit, and the moral memory. And we bring it together to dream about what ought to be. And we dream a new world into being. And I think all of us, that's the thing about moral imagination, all of us have it. It's just sometimes, you know, school tells us, don't think this way. But if you can think this way, it's the reason why Dr. King can go and protest in the streets and Bloody Sunday can happen and they come back again. It's why abolitionists, you know, go and, and free slaves. It's why Native Americans still are here today because they had enough moral imagination to think about seven generations after them and about what could be mm. for them. Hi, Reverend Eddie. Uh, my name is Rex. Thank you for this very inspiring and educational multiple forums. And um, my question is, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of diversity to the causes of poverty, mm -hmm. uh, to um, you know, discrimination, everything from, you know, beyond uh, Trump and the White House, what's happening with Epstein. That's all about abuse of power and so mm -hmm. forth. And yet I... Also, I'm wondering, and by the way, it's really easy to pull up and join in. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to read the guiding principles, and it's detailed, great read with a lot of different parts. Mm -hmm. But I've also been, for my professional society, when we go and engage Capitol Hill on a caucus, I'm a lung doctor, so, and I remember the people who organize say, look, when you go on a caucus, my thing is smoking and lung cancer. Someone else's oxygen access. Mm -hmm. Someone else's COPD, lung fibrosis. But for the time being, you got to learn to dance the Macarena. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. the amount of noise will just cancel each other out. So looking at 2019, 2020, what are the core focus that will make the first steps? Because otherwise, blue state, red state, purple state, I also do some work in South Dakota where the poverty between the Native Americans are very different from the, quote, poor white, not mm -hmm. so many people of color. So how do you feel we need to organize step by step so that there is harmony between the different constituencies of proponents of different color, of different states, of different mm -hmm. poverty and different uh, politics? Beautiful. So one way that we demonstrated this was last year we did 40 days of civil disobedience. Right, and we took each week, so it was six weeks, and each week we did exactly this. Because if you go to Capitol Hill or if you go to the State House, you don't got time to read 10 pages and give them a dissertation. Right? So we made it quick and easy, right? So we would go in and say, health care for everyone now. Right? And that was the that was the that was the tagline. Health care for everyone now. When we sung songs, health care for everyone now. As we're getting arrested. Health care for everyone now. Now the, now, the other part of that was that we sent an email to all of the Congress people that said, here's how you can implement health care in your state right now. Right? So here are the laws that are working in your state right now that can help us get health care for all, get us close to that. We say, uh, a living wage for everyone now. We, keyword, living wage, right? Because oftentimes we say, oh, we'll give you minimum wage, but how many of you know that if you have $15 an hour in California, especially in LA or in Pasadena, you're still pretty poor, right? So we say living wage now, right? Just make it a, t a tagline, and then we sung that, and we got, a, you know, got arrested, same thing, and we sent a, a message, right? So healthcare, uh, a living wage, education, access to education for everyone. These are, these are big, ideas, but there are one-liners that other organizations have policy around that we can uplift. But we can get together. So the thing about moral fusion is that when we go into uh, the, the state house and we talk about uh, not mass incarceration and a use for a new use of force policy in California, right? This is very practical. We went there. I could have talked about it, but they would have suspected me to talk about it. I'm a black man in California, and I work with Black Lives Matter. So we had our people from the health movement or the environmental movement who didn't look anything like us get up and say, hey, we need X, Y, and Z. What does that do 
to politicians is that when they, they can't put you in a box, right? They're like, wait, hold up. Hold up, what? you're environmentalist. Why are you talking to me about use of force policy, right? And that helps us have a dialogue and open up a conversation when we have a demand. That oftentimes we get stuck in like, this is my issue. And so if it's not my issue, we're talking about, I don't gotta show up. But the beauty of the Poor People's Campaign is that everyone shows up for everyone because your issue is my issue. Because at the end of the day, if your issue is about improving my quality of life, then I gotta care about it. And so we do one-liners, so distill it to one line when you advocate, right? Politicians don't got time to listen to you for 10 minutes. They got 90 seconds. So put it in a, in a bullet point, sing it, chant it, and then send the, send the good details later. Over here and Thank you from my heart for the loving and luminous work that you and everyone is doing. Um, my question is, is the Poor People's Campaign currently doing anything specific to raise up the poor elderly people's social security and the poor disabled people's social security, namely SSI? So, so thank you for that question. So nationally, that is a part of our moral budget and a part of our platform of demands. Because we talked, we, we realized that uh, the elderly are also a lot of the people who are actually in the cuffs of poverty, right? People who live on fixed incomes uh, are really close to one paycheck away from being poor or not being able to afford their medicine or to afford food on their table, right? You get one major devastation in the household or you know, the pipes break in your wall and it's like, oh, we gotta figure out what's gonna happen next, right? And so we have uplifted that in the moral budget as well as in our demands uh, on the national level. And then uh, locally when we did our protests for the 40 days, we, we uplifted that as well in the state house to try to get higher, raise the level of how much money the federal government and our state funds those type of programs, because it's very important. All right. One, One more, more question? One more, okay. Some Christians are always who want to justify maybe why they're not involved, is they quote Jesus, mm -hmm. the poor you have with you always. Mm -hmm. Would you speak to that? Sure. Um, he said some Christians will say not to be involved because they quote Jesus who says, the poor will be with you always. Well, I mean, I don't have enough time to unpack this <laughs> theologically, but I would say as good Christians, you know that when you read the text, you also need to know the context. You also should know uh, who is Jesus referring to in the audience, right? So think of, so Jesus is talking about poor and when, we like to think that he's talking about people who are economically poor, when it's really more around people who are poor in spirit, right? People who have lost hope but still have faith, right? They will be with you always. Because Jesus also says, right, and this is the gospel, gospel text, right, that, 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 that the lilies of the field, they don't worry because God takes care of them. How much more will God take care of you? Jesus also says, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare one for you, right? Jesus also says, I come that you have life and that you will have it more abundantly. And then there's this thing called the Sermon on the Mount, which we can talk about, right? And so it's like, when we talk about poor, let's not uh, cherry pick the text. Let's not use it and say, oh, he's talking about economic poverty. Well, also in the context that Jesus lived in, there's a thing around citizenship and like what you was afforded if you were a citizen of Rome and if you were not, right? And Jesus spent his whole life going around, turning over tables and telling people that everyone's included. So we gotta do a little bit of more uh, eisegesis and exegesis of our text before we <laughs> go and tell people that the poor review with us always. <laughs> Okay, oh, thank you so much. Um.